John Vento here at Steamworks Creative in Gibsonia, PA. You may know Steamworks as the home of much wonderful live music over the past two and a half years. But one of our goals was to find a way to connect music and live music and musical performers with the incredible spirituality that comes with those performances. And uh, in conversation with our dear friend, Pastor Greg Spencer, over the past few months, we have decided to launch a program on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. here at Steamworks called Steamworks Spirit Station. And uh, it's such an exciting new venture. It's open to the public. It's free of, there's no charge. We have soft drinks. We have a food court, right, Skip, over there filled with popcorn and all kinds of goodies. We have homemade ice cubes, which are the best in the business. And um, basically, we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun with a subject that uh, maybe some folks feel is taboo, a subject of faith and how that faith can be explored in a very open and contemporary way, interactive way. Uh, and it's going to be based around music. So all great things here at Steamworks on Tuesday nights. Uh, and uh, as we kick off our initial uh, spirit, our Steamworks Spirit Station, uh, we're thrilled to have our dear friend and musical guest, Cheryl Ann Hawk, with us tonight. So she's going to get things started, and then Pastor Greg is going to take over from there as our host. And uh, let's see where this thing takes us. What do you think? Good? Okay, let's go.
Full of love and connected. There's a song about forgiveness. It's based on a prayer called Ho'oponopono, which is, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, and thank you.
like it's the last time we got to show me love And then you see right through me, you show me love And then I see your beauty Steamworks Spirit Station. Thanks for the invitation.
Thank you so much. Well, this is a wonderful home for this new thing that we're doing here, some Steamworks Spirit Station. So I'm so happy to be a part of it. Wow, is, is Cheryl Ann something? I cannot get over it. I've had the privilege of hearing Cheryl Ann several times this summer, and every single time it's like magic. Oh, what a gift. What a talent. I am so honored that uh, you're with us tonight, Cheryl Ann. Thank you for being with us and being a part of this event and the start of what we hope will be something wonderful. Um, for those that are uh, unfamiliar with me, you might want to know a little bit. My name's Greg, uh, Greg Spencer. I'm a pastor ordained in the United Methodist Church and have been for more years than I care to talk about. Um, but uh, about almost 10 years ago, I started an online ministry called Waystations. Waystationsministries.org is where you'll find the website. And uh, the uh, interest that I have is the idea of one thing that actually my wife helped me to learn. We were taking some training in New Church Starts and how do you reach out to the, to the world. And one of the things that uh, we were looking at is what's your style of ministry? What, what is that? And uh, we went through a number of tests to figure out what that is. And uh, there, was, there was one that said uh, prophet, a prophetic kind of ministry. And there was one category that, that it said, uh, if you, do you preach the whole Bible or do you preach one message? And for me, I thought, well, I preach the whole Bible. I try to make the whole Bible become real and active and alive and, and practical for people. And so, you know, that's, I, I, don't, I preach Old Testament, New Testament, nothing stops me in anywhere. And Chris just looked at me and laughed. And she says, you preach one message. That's all you've ever preached. That's all you're ever gonna preach. I said, okay. What's that? And she said, live your faith. I went, that's it. She's absolutely right. It's about making it real in our lives. And the idea of, of Spirit Steamworks is that we want to make the spirituality of our hearts, the, the joy of music that we connect and, and people connecting together. We want to make that as real and as, and as powerful as it can be. We want to live as well as we can, no matter what the circumstances might be. And when we're exploring our spirituality, that means we're going to connect with one another. And I believe we're going to connect with God. And we're going to connect with the principles of God. And that's what we want to do. Now, I've done this in a variety of ways. If you go to the Waystations website, you're going to see that I've been a martial artist for a long time. And I teach karate. I teach tai chi. I teach kung tao. And, and that's a dimension, too. You know, it was the martial arts that taught me the physical dimensions of spirituality that I wasn't getting in church. Well, I know that sometimes people feel distant from God. They may even wonder if God is real or not. They may be saying, you know, I don't see any practical evidence of it in my life. And there are other persons that are real passionate about it. And what we're going to be about here is trying to bring all that together, we're trying to bring everyone together and trying to explore that a little bit. So <clears throat> one of the ways that we're doing that hopefully is creative and new and different. And what I like about doing it here at Steamworks is that it's not church related. We're not gonna be heavily religious, but we are gonna be spiritual and we are gonna to try to make it real for everybody that you can. So I hope that you enjoy it. And uh, there will be opportunities for you, to, whether you're online uh, alone or in groups, or if you're here, uh, there will be chances for you to talk together and to connect to each other. And we'll be doing that pretty soon. So first, every once in a while, I like to start with some poetry. And I have a poem that uh, we found for tonight uh, by Justin Farley. It's called The Light That Shines in the Darkness, a poem about hope. There's a light that shines in the darkness. There's a destiny waiting at the end of the road. There's meaning in the middle of this emptiness. There's a reason you've been asked to carry this heavy load. Lessons are taught when we reach out further than we thought we'd ever dare. Faith abounds when we confront our doubts, enduring more than we ever dreamed we could ever bear. There's a dawn waiting at the edge of every midnight. There's a seed planted with every fallen leaf. With every wrong, there's a chance to make it right. With a, every hour of suffering, there's an eternity of relief. Our darkest moments give us the opportunity for seasons of our greatest growth. 
Every day we work towards conti continuity of acceptance and persistent hope. There's a light that shines in the darkness. There's a star that guides the way. There's a gate that's open to forgiveness. There's a shepherd who saves all who've gone astray. Light and darkness is the subject for this evening. And we're going to be talking tonight about the book of Genesis from the Bible. Now, the book of Genesis means beginning, and uh, people wonder about that. You've, you've, I'm sure, heard the arguments and different people taking different positions about the scripture and whether it's true or not. Well, I think the Bible has a very important truth to tell. I think it's a living word that speaks to us in every generation, in every situation. And I've found that every time that I'm called upon to preach one text or another, it always says something new. I discover something new every time. And so if it's a living word, it means it's always current. It's timeless in its orientation. So let's be a little careful. When we talk about the, the Genesis and being written a long time ago, when was it written? It starts talking about the way the world was created. And I don't remember any reporters being around back then. I don't think they even knew how to write back then. If you read the story or if you think about the history, the way it's talked about in the world today, it was way before anybody had any real sense of intelligence or anything. It was a long time before human beings appeared. And when they did appear, they started their communication by paintings on cave walls. So what is this? Well, there's two aspects of the, of the Bible that I think are helpful for us when we start thinking about what does God have to say to us and what's he have to do with us and what does all this mean? And does it have any direction? Well, the first is the story of Exodus, which is the second book in the Bible, and that's a historical book. It was written around the time of Moses, which was about 742 years after the birth of Abraham, who is the first hero in the, in the Bible. And that is a long time after the very beginning of the scripture because it doesn't tell us when God actually created things. It tells us the order in which it occurred. It doesn't tell us when that occurred. So we're talking about a long time before there was any writing. Well, what's going on with Moses? We'll get to that someday down the road, but in the short run, let me just say that in the book of Exodus, it talks about the story of the Israelites who had for several hundred years been slaves, and then God delivers them. He sets them free from their slavery and delivers them through a wilderness towards the promised land. And it took him a long time to get there, which again, we'll talk about another time, but in the short run, let's just look at it from this point of view. If you, for all your history and all your family history and all the memory that you had was slavery, and now all of a sudden you are free and you're moving across the wilderness as a nation, as a, a population that is unique in the world, don't you think there'd be some questions you might be asking? Who are we? Where do we come from? What, what do we believe? Why do we believe it? What meaning does that have for us? That's the questions that people would be asking. How in the world do we get free and why? These are questions that they would ask. So what happened in the time of Moses is that they wrote down stories that had been passed down from the beginning of the faith. And they would pass these stories on to explain and to answer the questions that people were asking. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, this is how the book begins. <clears throat> In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Okay. So, well, people who are asking questions are trying to search for answers. And where does the beginning come from? What is God trying to say in this text? It's very simple. There is order 
to how everything came to be. That there is purpose and intention in all that was created. That there is a relationship that God has personality and character and he cares about what she built. God is concerned and plans. Now this is a big deal because in the time when all the different religions and faith were being born, there were a lot of different concepts about how the world began. And there was a lot of talking about conflict and struggle because that's what was happening between persons. The Israelites were saying, no, what we believe is that God came first. And there was a mess. It was dark and it was, it was confused and lost. And what he did is stepped right into the middle of it and brought light. And that changed everything. Now, I gotta know. Where did I put it? I gotta know. Do I wear this or not? Was I wearing it right? Is it... Did I get the right, is it right side up? Uh, wait, is it is it inside out? Maybe I should put it this way. Does that work? Is anybody affected by what's going on in the world around us today? Is anybody here concerned? Is anybody here wondering? Are you confused? Are you uncertain? What I want you to do is take just a moment now to, to talk around your tables, talk to each other. No, don't talk about the issue. We do that plenty. Don't talk about what's right and wrong, what this one said and what that one said. Don't, don't get into that. What we want to do is find a way to connect to each other. So what is it about this time that's affecting you emotionally or spiritually? Maybe it's irritation. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's upset. Maybe it's fear. But take just a moment to see where we connect because I think the anxiety that's happening today is all across our society. I think everybody's feeling it in some way. And what better way to communicate and to connect with one another than to say, yeah, you know, this is how I'm feeling. Say, so, wow, I'm feeling that way too. Take a moment just to talk to each other and to try to see where do we connect in the midst of all of this. Can't do it when you're sitting all across the room. <laughs> <laughs> Segway, come back. <laughs> Do you want me to like kind of fade out and put a pause in there? You can. Yeah, because I'll, I'll in there. Yeah, for online, that would be the best way to make it work. Some sure. kind of transition in there. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we move on to the next part there. <clears throat> so was I right? Are we anxious? Do we find points of connection? Did you notice that when you found a point of identification with each other that you felt better? simply because someone else understood. This happens a lot in lives when persons go through hardship in their life, whether it's grief or disease or, or tragedy or brokenness or disruption in relationships. People who have been through similar type circumstances understand very well, and they connect immediately to that. You know, it's, it's such a privilege and a joy for me to be here in Steamworks because of John Vento and because of the, the way we met and how we built a relationship very, very quickly. And how it happened was that I have a, a son who's on the autism spectrum. And we had heard about Band Together Pittsburgh and the ministry that they were doing with music for those that are on the autism spectrum. And so we heard that they were doing this open microphone here and we wanted to come and hear it and, and to connect with other people. And we connected that first day. We didn't know each other from Adam. And we connected right then. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey through Band Together, but now also in Steamworks. It's just a remarkable thing. But what happened at those Band Together things was people who all are affected by autism knew what the, each other was experiencing, and they reached out to each other. And in doing so, there was comfort to the heart, comfort to the mind, uplifting of the spirit, just by sharing the hurt that we're having. That's an awesome thing, that simply by connecting with each other, we feel a blessing. And it, it lifts our spirits and it encourages us. When someone understands, when someone's sensitive, oh, what a difference that makes. And we're so glad that that happened. Now, that doesn't stop there, of course. It's got to go further. It's got to go beyond that. So what is it about the anxiety? Have you ever heard of the initial or universal fear have you ever heard that reference? The very first thing the Bible talks about 
is the primal fear that everyone has, and that is darkness. We don't like being in the darkness. We don't like, and that happens for babies when they're born. They were inside this dark womb, and then they come out, and whoa, boy, am I glad I'm out of there. I don't know if that's a quote. But what, they, what we find is that the darkness is something that makes us feel anxious. The unknown causes us to feel anxiety and fear. And how we react to that varies. It varies with the time of day. It varies with the kind of circumstances that we're in or the confusion that we have. If you think about it, there are many different kinds of darkness that we experience. Sometimes it's fear, straight out fear. I am in this dark, unknown place. I don't know what's coming. And we're not talking about Halloween and, and haunted houses. We're talking about persons who have absolutely no idea where they're going or what's happening or what's coming next. And so it just feels like darkness. There's darkness that happens when you've got a problem that you can't solve and you're trying every possible way to resolve it. You're trying everything you can think of. You bring together all your experience, all your intelligence, all your education, all your resources, and you cannot find the answer. And there's a dark cloud inside you that you can't let go of. And sometimes those darknesses become greater to us than anything else. Sometimes that affects everything we think about and everything we talk about and everything we see. And, and what happens with darkness is it narrows your vision. You can't see anything. Now, the interesting thing is it actually widens your vision too. I'll tell you about that in a minute. In the darkness, we stop seeing anything else. We no longer focus on what's good in our life. We're thinking only about that problem. That problem can consume all of our thoughts and all of our emotions. And if it does that, then it affects all of our time and we, we don't experience anything good in that kind of circumstance. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you felt that? Have you thought that? I think that's the universal fear. I think that's the universal darkness. I think we all experience it. Then we have to say, well, what's the other side of that? We don't want to be in darkness, so what do we do? We start looking for the light, don't we? We start looking for ways in which we can find our way in the midst of that darkness. Is there a way that that can change? And so we'll look everywhere, and this is what happens. Your eyes dilate over a period of time in the darkness. If you didn't know about this, if you go out to watch the stars at night, you want to get away from city lights, and you want to take about 15 minutes where you're not looking at the stars at all. Because what you want is your eyes to orient to the darkness. And then, when your eyes are dilated and able to receive whatever light there is, then you look up and then you can see the majesty of the stars. Now that works really well if you're going out when there's a meteor shower too. You catch them very quickly and you can see them as they pass across the sky. You become as receptive as you can possibly be for any sign of good that comes. I'd like you to take a second to talk around your table about any time in your life when, in the midst of a difficulty, all of a sudden there was a light. All of a sudden there was a word of encouragement. You didn't expect it, and there it is. And you felt the uplift of finally seeing a little bit of a path in the midst of that darkness. Okay, can you take a moment to say, you know, did that happen in your life, and how did it feel when you saw that? Let's take a minute to do that. Welcome back. <laughs> Sometimes you have to call them all back to order. Here we are. Okay, well, in Genesis, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, what we see in the message of the Bible is that God brings order out of disorder, brings peace out of conflict, he brings light out of darkness. And he, the very first thing that God does is he makes light and says, I think light is good. And this is what we think too. When we find the comfort of light shining, that helps us to feel better, it helps us to gain more confidence, to make more steps, and to move forward. And we do so with confidence, so it increases our confidence. Now, the other point that I wanna to make to you is one of the concepts that was part true of primitive human beings when they were thinking about faith was that God is way out there and we are way down here. And they would often look at it in terms of up and down. They would say, heaven is up, God is up, and we're down or we're on earth. So that's the way they would conceive of it. And that's okay. I, I'm not sure that that's the way I would describe it today. I do see it in terms of distance. We are apart from each other. It would be nice if we come together and that will be another thing that we talk about. But in, for tonight, 
I'd like you to just for a moment think of that primitive way of understanding God. God being the creator, God being able to do anything, God being able to create anything, doesn't do that objectively, doesn't do that without in any concern or interest. If you've ever had to build something, if you've ever enjoyed a, developing a talent or a skill, if you've, if you've ever worked toward a goal, you know the joy you feel when it's accomplished. You know what that means to you when you get to do it. And so that's the way I think God would feel. And so God takes delight in the creation that God has made. And so he, uh, he she, uh, God in the spirit, rejoices in good and the light coming. Okay, so what we see later in the same chapter of, of Genesis, uh, <clears throat> I can read it to you here. Beginning with, uh, let's see, what is it? Verse 14. Verse 14. God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, and it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. God cares so much about the creation that God's made and knows the difference that seeing the light makes gives light all the time. There's never a time when there isn't light. The idea of the sun in the day, that's easy to understand. The moon at night, but it's not there every night, is it? It's there for a lot of the nights, but there's occasionally times where it's on the other side of the earth. That's the way it rotates. That's the way it... So God lets light shine everywhere. And in that ancient view, you think of this dome that covers or separates the light of God from the darkness on earth. And what happens is that God pokes holes in that covering so that the light shines through and you can see the you can see beyond the darkness. You can see the light of heaven even in the midst of the darkness. Now, what's that have to do with us? That's all great in understanding the Bible. What's that have to do with me? What it has to do with is the idea that if light is always present, then we need to take a look at what is it that we're looking at? What is it that we're focusing our attention upon? If I am looking for the light, my eyes are going to open, my mind is going to be more receptive, my heart is going to be open, and yeah, I'm going to feel some fear, I'm going to feel some anxiety, but I don't want that to be the most important thing. No, I want to trust and believe that there is light out there, and if I could see that light, then I'd be less afraid. And if I was less afraid, I'd be more confident. If I was more confident, then I would diminish my fear, or I'd overcome my fear. And then I would maybe see different options that are available for me in the midst of this, whatever this darkness is. Because here's what we know. In the midst of the anxiety that we're feeling right now, whether it's politics or coronavirus or, or uh, the, de the demonstrations that are taking place, the social issues that are really up in our minds, whatever your concern might be, the conversations that we have tend to repeat themselves. And the anxieties that we feel tend to be re-emphasized over and over again. Well, if we start looking for light in the midst of that, maybe we'd stop looking at the same thing, talking the same way, feeling the same stuff over and over and over again. Maybe what we'd find is a way to work with and beyond, to see a little bit beyond, because what we want to do is we want to get past the demonstrations to real effective change. What we want to get past is this virus so that we can be more productive. Now, that may mean that we have to adjust in the middle of it. We may have to compensate for it in some way, but we never want that to be more important than our goal for quality living and getting along with each other. So what we want to do is let light shine within as well as without. You don't just look for it coming to you. You realize that God has created light and he separates that from the darkness. And light is where I want to be. So let me look for where that light is and probably go that way. If I know where the light is, that's where I'm going to be. 
If I know where the help is, that's where I'm going to go. If I know there's a person who's, who can make a difference in the, in the feeling of my life, then that's the person I want to be with. That's what we do when we go to listen to music. That's what we do when we go to see our favorite movie for the 50th time. That's what we do when we go out to watch the sunset or to see the stars. We're reaching out beyond ourselves. We're looking beyond the struggles that we're not happy with and saying, you know, that's not the definition of my life. There is something more. There's something better. There's something greater. And I have the means of getting there. What I know is for a while, I've been stuck. Maybe I couldn't do anything about it before, but maybe I'm reaching the stage where I can do something about it now. And if I do, every step is a 100% improvement. How do I know that? Because once I was here, I take a step, and now I'm here. It's a completely different place. It may not seem like that much, but for someone who hasn't had any hope and now does, it is a complete change of life. That's what we're striving for. That's what we're here for. That's what we'd like to have happen. Wouldn't it be great if everybody could be happy? Wouldn't it be great if everyone could have peace and love and gratitude? How much happier would we be? That's what we're working towards. Sometimes we get distracted along the way, but that's why we're here at Steamworks Spirit Station. One more time, let's welcome back to the stage, Cheryl Ann Hawk. All right, well, thank you, Pastor Greg, so much for that wonderful message about shining light through the darkness. And I know that my favorite way of shining my light is with love and gratitude. Sometimes it takes a while to just let go of the things you know. Make you feel like you're more than just a little bit crazy. Just a little smile from folks who know when you've lost your glow and pick you up just enough to lift you up and then maybe you remember what you are craving you remember who you are you remember why you're amazing you remember when you are far from the place where your grace can be spreading like wildfire All you need is some love and some gratitude Sometimes you need some time to take a deep breath Give your mind a rest Take some time to unwind and have a moment to remember You will be just fine if only you know you can only do what you're able to in time if you're gentle and tender. You remember what you are craving. You remember who you are. You remember why you're amazing. You remember when you are fine from the place where your grace can be spreading like wildfire. All you need is some love and some gratitude. Let your love flow everywhere that you go. Wrap your arms around the ones you love. Show them that you're grateful every brand new day. All you need is some love and some gratitude. 
to All you need is some love and gratitude Much love and gratitude to you. Thank you. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce my wife, Chris. And uh, one of the things that we like to do in, our, in events like this is we like to leave you with a thought that may help you in the week to come. It's not that this gets encapsulated into one little space and that's it. It's, uh, but it can make a difference spiritually for you where you go. And so one of the, t the things that we do is we think, is there a song that we could do with a catchy tune, it's just got a few words that anybody could remember. And if it's good, and if it makes a difference for you, that might last with you for the week. And if you find, like for tonight, if you think that you've got a little bit of that anxiety and you'd like to get a little bit of that light, then you remember this phrase, you remember this song. And that just might lift your spirit a little bit and, and give some room for God to work with you. And so we, we're, what we're going to <laughs> What we're going to do is teach you the chorus. We'll sing it a couple times so that you can hear it, and then we'll invite you to sing it with us, and maybe that'll last with you for a little while. Ready? <clears throat> Come, Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. Fill me with your power. Satisfy my need. Only you can make me whole. Give me strength to make me grow. Come, Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. And that's inviting the light in. So see if you can sing it with us. We'll do it twice together, and then uh, hopefully that'll linger with you for a while. Okay? Come, Holy Spirit. Fall afresh on me, fill me with your goodness, satisfy my need. Only you can make me whole, give me strength to make me grow. Come Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. Come, Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. Fill me with your power, satisfy my need. Only you can make me whole, give me strength to make me grow. Come, Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. Thanks for being with us tonight.